Um, so my name is Richard Kavanagh. I'm a designer with VRFI, and I'm here to present the work that we've done on uh, the automated measurement and evaluation for six-bit amplitude and basal drum measures. So I'll introduce the work we did um, and why. Uh, present sort of the me measurement, main measurement challenge that we had. Um, show the automated measurement setup and the procedure that we went through. Uh, compare the automated measurements that we did with what the manual alternative would be. Show the results that we obtained and, and summarize at the end. So we investigated the performance of a 12-bit uh, gain phase control module, which was built using a 6-bit digital attenuator and a 6-bit phase shifter. And we did some similar work for a client on a 12-bit, on the measurement of a 12-bit uh, phase shifter, but we can't show the results there, so we, we decided instead to model, uh, to measure these two devices together, which make up 12 bits in total, um, and allows us to demonstrate the measurement system. So these could potentially be used as a vector, a vector modulator for something like uh, phased array antennas or beamforming. Uh, so we've used off-the-shelf devices rather than something we've designed, and they cover a range of uh, 3 to 6 gigahertz, which is primarily what we're interested in looking at in seeing the performance. Um, but we, are, we were curious to see if they could be used outside of that frequency range, uh, potentially with a reduction in the bit resolution. The main challenge was just the number of states to measure. Um, it's 12 bit control, so two to the 12 states to measure. Um, so we can't do that manually. Um, and then on the plotting and analysis side, there's too much uh, data to go through individually, so that needs to be automated uh, as well. So this is the, a block diagram of the measurement setup we had in the lab. Um, we were interested in the small signal performance of the devices, so we measured the S parameters um, of the phase shifter and attenuator together using uh, the BNA which uh, can go up to 50 gigahertz, but we uh, only measured up to 20 because that was enough to characterize the devices. Uh, so the automation was controlled uh, from a laptop, uh, which communicated with the PMA with GPIB. <coughs> so that takes care of the S parameter measurements. And then we needed to change the gain phase states uh, of the devices um, before each measurement, which was set using a, a digital input-output device, um, also controlled from the laptop. So that outputs a digital one or zero, so either five volts or zero volts, which can be used directly to set the control voltages. Um, but if you have devices that operate from a different voltage, say one volt or ten volts, um, we run that. We can run the outputs through uh, single single throw switches um, connected to a power supply unit to set in uh, a different control voltage. Um, and this just shows the setup in the lab. Uh, just a bit crowded, but we've got the devices on the bottom left, measured by the PNA in the top left. Um, the DAP that's labeled uh, is the input output device uh, connected to the three green switch ports uh, to sub in the control voltage uh, from the DC supply on the right hand side. Um, so we wrote an, automated, uh, an automation program uh, in Python, the back end, to communicate with the equipment and do all the calculations, uh, and then a front end user interface. Uh, just to improve usability and reduce the likelihood of us making an error when we're typing stuff into the terminal. Um, so this is just a, a screenshot from, from one of the windows uh, on the parameter, uh, parameter entry screen. Yeah, we sort of stopped, uh, stopped where we did, but we could develop that, develop that further in the future um, if we want. So uh, this is a flowchart showing uh, the main measurement procedure. Sorry, I'm not sure if that's echoing showing the main measurement procedure that the program goes through. Um, so we, uh, it starts off and connects to, um, connects to the instruments that we're using. Then we either set or load the program settings. Um, so these get saved automatically at the end. And uh, you can either set them manually or you can just load from a previous run so that you don't need to do that. Um, then if the PNA has been calibrated, uh, you go onto the main automation loop. If it hasn't, uh, then that gets calibrated with the ECAL module, um, again done manually. And then in the main automation loop, um, so the laptop sends a signal to the input output device to change the control bits. Uh, this then goes to the switchboards to change the to set the actual voltages on the control pins of the devices under test. And then we have an optional delay before we trigger uh, the measurement of the S parameters, which is needed if you have if you're measuring devices that have a particularly uh, large settling time um, to ensure that you don't start measuring the S parameters before the game phase states have been uh, changed. But in practice, we tried a few different delays and found it had no effect on the boards that we were measuring, so uh, we left this out. 
then we can copy the S parameters uh, to the laptop. But we, in practice, we copy the S parameters to the laptop and into a server, um, which allows us to monitor what's going on remotely um, and also has an extra uh, backup. Has an extra backup, um, but this can be done afterwards uh, if, ne if necessary. Then it all takes up in measurement you finish. If not, keep repeating until you've got all the measurements you want. Yeah. Um, so to compare this, well, we, we ran this uh, setup a few different times, and the average uh, measurement time is about 4 hours 48 minutes, um, which we can reduce by about 12% if we uh, move the copying S parameter stage afterwards, um, which the link takes it about to the, down to about 4 hours and 13 <laughs> minutes, but it's still about the same order of magnitude. Um, and then when we measured the board separately, I think it was about 6.5 minutes uh, for each board, so 64 states each. So then just to offer a comparison of what that might take if you were to do it manually. Uh, we think about nine days if you were to do, we just said, uh, one minute for each measurement. So one minute to set the control bits, perform the measurements, save the files, uh, make sure you haven't made any mistakes. Um, yeah, working eight hour days. So it's definitely a big time saving, So as you'd expect. Um, if that's still, uh, still not enough uh, and you want to optimize it further, we could try things like running the code directly on the PNA to save the so that you didn't have to send commands from a laptop each time um, to optimize it a bit further. But most of this time is dominated by the PNA sweep time um, and the PNA itself that we were using. So there's a limit to how much uh, we can increase this without changing the equipment that we used. So <coughs> before we measured both devices together in all the states, uh, as an extra verification step for our setup, we measured each board separately um, and then compared them with uh, the, the data sheet plots. Um, so you've shown a couple here, uh, the data sheet plots on the left hand side, our measured plots on the right hand side, which I hope they're not too faded. Um, hopefully so you can see the agreement for the phase shifter was uh, pretty close. For the attenuator, some of the plots match quite closely. Um, like you see with the normalized attenuation, uh, some of them weren't quite as close, um, like with the state error against the attenuation state, um, which varied based on frequency. But we decided it was okay to proceed in the end because uh, most of the, the poorest errors to the green line on the right hand side um, was at the top edge of the frequency band at 6 gigahertz. Um, but in the middle of the frequency band, so at 4 gigahertz, um, we saw better uh, the errors that we measured below it, so we thought it was okay. Um, so this is for now on to both boards measured together uh, across the full state range. Um, we measured from 0 to 20 gigahertz, all those devices are only uh, spec uh, up to 6, just to see over what range it could potentially fully work. So we see that up to about 12 gigahertz, there's maybe up to, up to about 14. We still uh, see some ability to control the phase and to control the attenuation. <laughs> Above that, the devices start converging towards a single state. So from 14, 15 gigahertz upwards, it can't be used um, at all. Um, and at first glance, the best performance seems to be within that 3 to 6 gigahertz uh, specification range. Okay. Then uh, if we plot the relative gain and phase shifts, uh, these are plotted relative to uh, the nominal 0 degree, 0 dB reference state um, highlighted in black. Um, and it's a bit clearer to see the performance is relatively flat across uh, the main band. Um, <coughs> it can be used up to about uh, 7, maybe 8 gigahertz with like any issues. Um, with the gain, it starts to spread apart. You can't see any obvious gaps, um, but the fact that it's spreading means there will be some, some gaps in there, um, increasing the error rate, um, and particularly at the highest and lowest attenuation levels. Um, it's not as usable, um, but it's better than the phase, which, um, particularly at higher frequencies, they start converging towards um, single states, reducing the effective bit resolution of the device, um, which could be an issue. And then to make, a, to make some of that a bit more, a bit clearer, uh, we plot only 64 states here. So the control bits from the phase shifter have been kept constant and the phase, the control bits for the attenuator have been varied. Um, you can see from, again, 2 to 7 gigahertz, it's reasonably consistent. At high frequencies, the attenuation range started to converge. So the device can still be used, but not in the full 32 dB range that you took for at lower frequencies. So you need to make adjustments in how you use the devices. 
but the performance is definitely better than with the phase where at high frequencies they converge, converge to relatively fewer states and the gaps between states in particular. Uh, the gaps between the different states are inconsistent. So even if you reduce the bit resolution of the devices to try and use them at higher frequencies, there's a chance that that still won't be enough. And then at lower frequencies, you also see that there are crossovers when the gain, when the phase errors increase, um, but because they increase in both directions, there are no major, major gaps, so it can still be used uh, below 3 gigahertz. So to evaluate the gain and phase errors together, um, we have something like, I call it state position error. It might have a, a proper name, but um, it's similar to EVM, but rather than using a constant reference, am reference amplitude, and for each point it uses one of 64 reference amplitudes. So we still calculate the error vector between the measured point and the ideal points, to either by reference and then calculate the mean square value. Um, but because the, with the phase shifter constellation, as you move further away from the origin, the points uh, spread out in distance. So uh, error magnitudes near the, near the outside, um, near the outside of the S21 block, greater error amplitudes can be tolerated without causing a symbol error, whereas the same error magnitude further in would be confused with a different symbol. Um, so we're going to use uh, EVM to evaluate this. Um, so that, that metric is on the right hand side. Um, so here, <coughs> when we select the default control bits, so that's if we were to look at the data sheets and say I want a specific phase shift and a certain attenuation level, um, what phase error, what gain and phase errors will I get? Uh, with the gain error, it's mainly just shifted upwards, which could be corrected by uh, changing your uh, normalization point. Um, it wouldn't be fully corrected, but you could get most of the way there. Whereas with the phase error, that increases as the attenuation level of the attenuator is increased. Um, so in all, in all of these plots, uh, as the state number reduces from 4096 down to zero, the attenuation level increases um, and the phase is constantly going through 360 degrees. Um, and that high phase error is reflected in the state position error. Um, so the state corresponding to each nominal uh, phase shift and attenuation that level doesn't necessarily have the best uh, best error, but as you saw in the previous slides, the coverage of gain phase was still pretty comprehensive. So there are states that are close close to the ideal states; they're just not the default ones. Um, so we created a lookup table for each desired state at each frequency. Um, I actually nominal phase and attenuation level, which identifies the lowest uh, error for each measurement state. And when we do that, we see uh, a large improvement. Now, most of the errors are within the tolerances for um, each state. Um, yeah, and the state position error has reduced from about 27% down to about 3.49%. Um, so, a, a pretty big increase. The one main, the main error that we still see here is at low state numbers. Um, hopefully, you can see the gain error is. Uh, there are quite a few points with high gain errors which is also reflected in the uh, state position error. Um, and the reason for this is uh, down to the choice of normalization state. Um, so ideally, when we uh, measure the ST1 points um, and then plot them, um, they would look, and normalize them, they would look like they do on the left-hand side. With the, with the nominal reference point, they look like they do in the center, which is because the nominal point in this case happens to have a relatively low amplitude relative to the other points, which leads to an excess of points outside that unit circle. And if we were to zoom in the center, there would be a lot of missing states um, that don't map to anything on the, or states in the center of the graph on the left-hand side that don't map to anything on the, the center in the circle. Um, so to correct that, we can choose a different normalization point. Um, we could pick an optimal point, a different optimal point for frequency, um, but the approach we went for is to pick the median amplitude, the state with the median amplitude from the nominal 64 0 dB states, um, which holds, which we found works for quite a few different frequencies. So we could pick a different point by frequency, but it would be a bit too um, computationally complex, I guess. So when we do that, uh, we now don't see that same uh, high number of points, not high number of points at low state errors with uh, high gain errors 
um, there are not <coughs> high state numbers with higher gain errors, but um, this was the best that we were able to achieve. Uh, so now over 90% of the points are within the tolerances for the gain and phase errors. And 88% of the points are within the errors for both. So that's 88% of the points on the vector modulator constellation that can be correctly um, identified or correctly mapped to a measured point. And then the state position error hasn't improved uh, markedly. It's gone from 3.49 to 3.14%. So most of the difference is from the use of the lookup table um, rather than this choice of normalization point. Then plotting the gain and phase plot, uh, gain and phase points against each other. Uh, the left hand image is mainly there to show uh, the good coverage at this frequency. You can still see certain gaps and certain uh, repeating patterns um, in terms of the errors, but overall the coverage is quite good. And the image on the right hand side is there to show the uh, rotation of, or the increase in phase shift as the attenuation level has increased. So the red and the orange points there the phase shift has been set to the same setting and the, the attenuation level has been changed. And ideally they would be sitting on the same uh, radial line going from the centre. But as the attenuation level has shifted, the, you get a 30 degree sh phase shift from the orange point to the red point. Um, which is why we got that back here in the earlier graph and why uh, we need to select uh, optimal points uh, more carefully. So we've got the, R the RMS errors. Here they just plotted from 2 to 7 gigahertz um, and calculated in the main frequency band. So we get um, below 0.19 dB, below 0.186 for the phase error, and below 3.7 for the state position error. Which, those errors are both below the tolerances for, uh, yeah, both below the, the tolerances for each state. Um, alternatively, you can look at the proportion of points that are within the tolerances the gain phase. Um, so as expected, the attenuation and phase, error are, phase errors are hired separately. Um, and then when you look at the proportion of points within both of them, um, that drops to about 85% for a few frequencies and then further below that. And then the graph on the right hand side is there to show the, uh, the way that the performance varies with frequency. So as the frequency is increased outside the main specification band, the accuracy decreases the accuracy with which you can detect a point decreases roughly linearly, I'd say, um, down to about 14 gigahertz. So it could be usable, um, but the bit resolution would have to be reduced, or rather the resolution of the constellation that you're using would need to be reduced to still use the device. Um, and then just to plot a couple of our constellations with a smaller number of points here, um, we've got 64 QR on the left hand side, and uh, the highest number I could go up to was 256QR on the right hand side um, before. So with this number, um, all, of the measured, all of the ideal points have can be mapped to a, a measured point, but with any higher number, um, you start to get errors. So if that were plotted on this graph, it would be 100%. Um, and then this is actually EVM, um, so there's a constant reference amplitude that's used for each point other than variable. So yeah, that's, that's what we did. So we developed an automated test setup to measure and evaluate the performance of a 12-bit vector modulator or any 12-bit device that could be a phase shift or a attenuator or something different. Um, up to 50 gigahertz, because that's what we have available. So it's much faster than manual setup, as you'd expect. Uh, it can be left unsupervised or monitored remotely if you wanted to do that, or controlled remotely. Um, and then our main findings, we see the best performance as you'd expect within the specification range for each device, maybe slightly outside that. And by generating the lookup table with the optimal state, um, we see a pretty big improvement in performance um, with max gain, R, max RMS gain and phase errors of 0.19 dB and 1.86 degrees respectively. So to some extent it works over a larger frequency band, but the resolution of the constellation you use will need to be reduced um, in order to operate it with the same error. And uh, in terms of developing this further, we might look, we might look at incorporating EVM and which data measurements uh, into the test bench, um, rather than doing that separately. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's it for the presentation. Thanks for listening.